l- let me start with René Descartes, the French philosopher, asserting cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. We think absolute proof that we exist. We have our own being or nature. That is to say, our psyche, soul or spirit. But we think with words of our only means, which are our minds, imaginations, imagination, invention. In Latin, venire, to come upon or find within. And so we are all our words. Our words translate our consciousness, our sense of reality, what parts of it we can grasp, comprehend. Therefore, our words endow our thoughts, feelings, and intuitions with a material, apprehensible form which enables us to communicate or express what we sense or feel. What we think, feel, is true, right, and just. What we suppose, discern, or believe in faith. The Greek word etimus gives the English word etimun, meaning true, which both signify a word's literal meaning or significance from its provenance or origin. So, if a thing's origin shows its essence, the kind of thing it is, then the nature or being of words is truth saying. All our words speak true. The poet Gertrude Stein says, a rose is a rose is a rose. Not a gumamela, a rose is a rose. Honor in any language is honor. Only the liar abuses, corrupts language, deceives himself and others as well, and degrades his own nature. For if the word's nature or being is truth saying, and we are our words, then our own nature or being is truth seeker. That's why we have a saying, he is a man of his word, a man of honor, a man of integrity, is a man of his word. Now, language, you know, the word language is from old French word tongue, meaning to say lung, meaning to say the tongue, uh, suggesting that it is with words and words that we would savor our experience of reality, our living of life. Language generally is any means or medium of expression, any mode of communication by which to signify a thought or concept, a feeling, a sense or sensation. It is our finest and supreme invention because without language, we would have no memory no history, no culture, no civilization. Language and imagination are one. 
We think with words, our only means. To think well is to imagine well. The word of the text evokes an image. The image lights up its meaning. The ground of language is a people's culture, evolving, transforming through a people's history. So, from birth, one's consciousness or psyche, one's thought and feeling, are shaped by his community's speech or language. And so, one is already spoken for. But still, being free, cogito ergo sum, in his own time, one may speak back and even reshape, transform a way of thinking and feeling in his community about our human reality or world. If we are our words, and all our words speak true, then our nature or being is truth seeker. But Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, in his book, Critique of Reason, asserts concepts without intuition are empty. Intuitions without concept blind. Thus, all our words, which are our invention, found within our consciousness, all our words yearn for light, for they are but our concepts, all abstract. To grasp, understand something, is, so to speak, to stand under a cloud of unknowing. The more we know, the less we know. And so, we never cease to wonder and inquire, to reflect. Where questions cease, the quest stalls or ceases. Now, let us talk about poetry. The art or craft called creative, imaginative, or literary work, whatever kind or species of poetry, fiction, drama, essay, or creative fiction, whatever creative work calls for adequate mastery of the medium, language, as one employs and deploys the words. Thus, the sense for language is the basic poetic sense. It isn't language. It isn't language that deteriorates, but the sense for language. And what enhances the sense for language is the love and habit of reading and reflection on the poet's or the writer's skill or craft of writing. Ezra Pound says, the writer's job of work is to keep the language efficient. That is to say, keep the language accurate. Keep it clear. The text or word weave is not so much written in a given language, Tagalog or English, but wrote from a given language. That is to say, work into shape by artistry or by effort. The poem 
any literary work or creative work or its work of language and work of imagination working together. For language is the poet's muse and imagination his spirit guide. The poet answers the call of language, a cry without an alphabet. Poetry is his vocation, the creative work called poetry. The call is subtle. It begins with pictures, the alphabet, and their murmurs brew the words, and endless tales in childhood and early youth. Later comes an impression that enthralls. There must be a spiritual realm within language toward which one's workaday world moves. It would seem then that language is the less human frontier. If one could cross it, one would find a new heaven, a new earth. As work of language, the poet finds his own path through the lexical wilderness of language, where he makes his own clearing even as the farmer fills the soil for the soil to bear his crop. In that wilderness of words, the words call to one another, so the poet must listen to their cries. They converse. Words play and conspire. That Latin word conspire, conspirare, to be in harmony, to breathe together. The words breathe together in a creative work. They conspire, they are in harmony. The poet struggles with this muse, the imagination. Agon. The Greek word agon is the English word agony, which is the Greek word for contest, struggle. The poet's contest or struggle with language is his poem, what Gerard Manley Hopkins calls the achieval, that is to say, what is achieved for now and tomorrow, because revision may still be possible. Or, it is not only the achievable, it is already the mastery of the thing, the very poem itself, the short story or essay or play or drama that you have written. The poem's wholeness is its form, the harmony of all elements of the word weave or text, their denotations and connotations of words breathing together. The language of the poem or short story is its own because it is wrought from, created from a given language. Thus, the poem, the creative work, has its own being, like any living creature in the world. But of course, a particular poem or short story's being exists only in the mastery. In that mastery, in the imagination's universe, that is to say, the poet's imagination and the imagination of the reader through all time that the poem is read. When the poem's wholeness comes its power or dunamis or energy 
manifest in the effect on the reader or critic. If or when the reader or critic is moved by the poetic mimesis or representation, a representation that makes the imagined experience come alive in the poet's imagination as well as in the reader's imagination. Since that effect is grounded on each one's own reading or interpretation of the poem, the poem's word weave, it springs from work of language and work of imagination on the reader's part as well as on the critic's part, as it was on the poet's part. The poem's power is what Horace calls dulce et utile, which Jonathan Swift translates, according to Matthew Arnold, as sweetness and light, dulce et utile, sweetness and light. Or, if you will, revel, joy, and revelation, insight. As work of language, the poet's subject or theme, Tagalog Paksa, theme, is a human experience as lived, as recalled, or as imagined as lived, be the experience only a thought or an intuition, be the experience only a sensation or a feeling or a mood, be the subject or theme only a stance or attitude toward something or other, or a character one has met. The poet creates the context of the experience he imagines or has experienced. In Middle English, the same word context, Latin texere, texere, is the weaving together of words to throw light on the significance of what has been depicted. With the right words in the right order, the poet endows the experience with flesh, resurrect the experience as it were in his mind and in his reader's mind. So that the poem over time from reader to reader takes on as many lives as its interpretations according to the reader's own consciousness of what is real or what is true. For as one reads, one is also read. One interprets and draws from his own experience, including his other readings. Thereby, he may even at times sound or Fatum, on reflection, his own self's mystery, because as he reads, he is also read. The poet discovers over time his own style, his own way with language, which Albert Camus defines as the simultaneous existence of reality and of the mind that gives reality its form. For as the poet works with and in his poem, he seeks the truth in the experience that the poem depicts, an insight or intuition, a luminance of thought that no idea expresses a radiance of feeling that no thought apprehends. What the, poet, what the poet achieves as the mastery of the thing 
the experience that he wants to represent is also called the artistic end or purpose. That end, which is the point of effect or power, is the poem's final cause, which manifests its being or soul or spirit. In Tagalog, diwa, the meaningfulness or inscape of the experience that all the words, all the poems, words conspired to endow it with flesh. By way of conclusion, our literature in the Philippines is one archipelago of letters wrought, created from many languages which have intermarried over time, all in spirit or diwa, as much Filipino as any language, any work written in any Filipino language. It is stressing that any language, including Spanish and English, in our own uses of them over the years, can express anything at all that the mind and heart seeks to grasp. Because writing is a discipline, a craft or power of what the words are made to do, such that what is wrought can through the evocative power of imagination on both the writer and the reader's part, transcend the inherent inadequacy of any language to probe and encompass all of reality. The very fact that the writer deals in daily life with English, for example, and his own native tongue, for example, Tagalog or Cebuano, may even be a distinct advantage. If he is observant and sensitive, he might become more and more familiar with the space between languages where precisely he must struggle for a clear expression of his insight through the language of his choice. It is in our imagination where our words come alive and speak true. The imagination has well nigh infinite possibilities. Since our words' meanings arise from lives lived through a people's history and changes in their culture, the poet's inmost seal is the poet's country. One sense of country, country, nation, all abstract, a concept, is how one imagines her. One sense of country is how one imagines her. A country is what a people's imagination owes its allegiance to. Our literature wrote from whatever language, in whatever genre, poem or short story, is what creates our sense of country, which ultimately is forged by our sense for language. Our literature is our people's memory. A country is only as strong as our people's memory. The writer stands upon his own ground, his own native clearing, the way his fellow countrymen think and feel about their world and so live from sun to sun. In that clearing in his own time, the writer forges language in the smithy of his mind and heart and grasps his own consciousness of his world, his reality. There too, in the poetry, the poem is wrought, 
if one reads close and imagines well as he interprets the poem, all artists and his kindred in any field of human endeavor may turn out to be his country's best critic and interpreter, and thereby he might in turn even refresh or enrich a current vision of his country's destiny or renew a lost heritage or tradition or even transform it. Thank you very much for your, for your patience listening. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, here's my poem. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I teach my child. I teach my child to survive. I begin with our words, the simple words first and last. They are hardest to learn. Words like home or friend or to forgive. These words are relations. They are difficult to bear. Their fruits are unseen. Or words that promise or dream. Words like honor or certainty or cheer. Rare is of sound, their roots run deep. These are words that aspire, they cast no shame. These are the words of which we consist indefinite without other ground. My child is without syllables to offer him, captive yet to his origin in silence. By every word to rule his space, he is released. He is shaped by his speech. Every act, too, is first without words. To adjust, there is no rehearsal. To adjust your deed from direction of his words. The words are given, but there's no script. Their play is hidden. We are their stage. These are the words that offer to our care both sky and earth. The same words that may elude our acts if we speak them but cannot meet their sound. They strain us still in their void. Blank like the child with the uphill silence of his words climb. And so I teach my child to survive. I begin with our words, the simple words first that last. Okay. <laughs> bye bye.